Welcome back to the Think Deeper podcast. I'm your co-host, Will Harib, joined by Jack and Joe Wilkie. Excited about our episode today. Before we get into that, there's a couple things that we want to uh, mention, and then we'll get rolling with the episode. So the first thing is we just want to make sure that everybody is aware of the other podcasts that are on our Focus Press podcast network. Um, the uh, Get Out of Porn podcast is one that Joe has, um, 50 episodes worth for anybody who is struggling with a pornography addiction and maybe want some listening material. Joe's covered, again, 50 episodes, so a lot of different angles on that. I'd encourage you to check that one out. Uh, the Who Let the Dogma Out podcast is another one that has got has uh, that one goes in seasons. Whereas Think Deeper, we obviously do this every week. Uh, Who Let the Dogma Out uh, finished season two recently, and so I'd encourage you to go check some of that out. I think there is a season three coming, so excited about that. That's with Jack, um, Daniel Mayfield, and Titus Anderson. Um, so really good stuff there. And then finally, the Godly Young Men podcast is another weekly podcast that we do. Uh, Joe and myself do that one um, for young men um, talking about masculinity, talking about what it means to be a godly young man. We, again, do that one every week. We do that on YouTube as well. So, again, I know we have a lot of listeners who are probably familiar with all three of those, but on the off chance that there's some people listening who aren't, we'd encourage you to go check those out. We obviously strongly believe in every single one of those. And, uh, yeah, we encourage you to take a look at them. The last thing that I'll say, and then I'll hand it to Joe. Um, we have started the process uh, through our uh, podcast linking system um, of placing ads in the podcasts. Um, and through the the host site that we have, we don't really have any kind of control over uh, which ads are popping up on our podcast or anything like that. And so we would ask if the, the, if there is anything that you hear ad wise that you know is not appropriate for our for content, please shoot us a message to let us know. They have assured us that they, uh, that any ads that will be placed on our uh, podcasts, you know, avoid all the the big stuff. And so uh, we are kind of flying blind on it. So we'd appreciate it if anybody hears something that might be a little questionable, just let us know. But, you know, in the current state of the economy and things like that, it's not the best time of uh, year for donor-based ministries. And streets, but we are advantage of this. Hopefully, um, we're not going to spam you with ads or anything like that, but any kind of uh, revenue we can pick up from it. Um Obviously, it's going to help us and help our ministry and help keep it going. So, uh, but we did want to make you aware of that. And again, if you hear anything slightly objectionable, just let us know and we will uh, get that addressed with our hosting site. But thank you for tuning in. We are super excited for this week's episode. There are um, a lot of really good questions that we've got. We're talking about prayer. I'm going to hand it off to Joe to really get us into some of the things that we're going to cover, why we're doing this episode. And, and again, as I'm just looking through the outline, he's got eight, 10, 12 questions that we're going to ask him. We were talking off air. I think that's typically what makes podcasts like these interesting and enjoyable is, you know, answering some of these tough questions and might not always have, you know, rock solid answers, but obviously we're going to answer them to the best of our ability. So Joe, go ahead and get us into what we're going to be covering with this episode on prayer. Yeah. So this was a requested episode. Uh, David North, actually, shout out David. Um, one of our uh, deep thinkers had asked us a long time ago, and he had a series of great questions on prayer. Jack, I think you're the one that dug that back up through Patreon. What episode was that on? Uh, it wasn't actually an episode. We uh, put that out to our, our Focus Plus subscribers. Oh, what, okay. what would you like to hear? And uh, and so we've we've gotten a few episodes out of the the responses out of that. So I think this was the last one left. We had not come to. So well, there you go. And we might do that again. So that's a shout out to join Focus Plus if you want to have a say in what episodes come next. But um, shout out David again. A lot of great questions on here. And to be honest with you, I think. More people struggle with the concept, uh, the idea of prayer than I think we realize. Because when you start asking some of these difficult questions, there's a lot of people that don't know. We know it's important. We're told it's important. We've heard all the sermons on it being important, but is it effective? Um, what we, obviously, you can quote, the fact that prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. What does that look like? Does God always answer? Well, he doesn't always answer yes. Okay, well, how do I know that's God and not somebody else, right? How do I know... Like, does it actually change things? Does this, is God listening to my prayers? There's a lot of those things where maybe somebody hears no a lot from God, where it's just, he's not coming through, quote unquote. Um, that's a challenge and it challenges our faith. I feel like prayer challenges people's faith almost more than anything else because of sometimes the perceived silence on the part of God. And then they wonder if God cares and God listens. And so it is something that, again, a lot of Christians are struggling with, um, and I think they've wrestled with the purpose, and, and this is great alliteration, I should make a sermon out of this, but the purpose, the power, and the place of prayer in a Christian's life. I think they really struggle with those concepts, and this is not new. This has been going back for centuries. This goes back to the early church fathers, Augustine, 
uh, Luther, Martin Luther had a ton in, in the Middle Ages and such, going back to the 1600s and Reformation and lots of quotes on prayer, how it works, you know, what, what God's doing in prayer, things like that. So it's just a very interesting topic. It may be one of those where you go, oh, yep, I know how to pray. We're going to get to your point where, uh, Will, we're going to get into some pretty deep questions and some things that have very much challenged me, things that I've thought about a lot over the last several years as I've been wrestling with the concept of prayer and, again, what it is, how it works, um, why we do it, you know, why it's important, and then just some, some of the general questions. So, Jack, I'm going to hand it off to you, to case, unless there's anything else that you want to get us into intro-wise. I want you to get us into the most basic of all questions, but maybe there's a little more underneath it than, than what meets the eye, which is, what is prayer? What is prayer? Yeah, I, I mean, it, it really does sometimes feel like especially private prayer, like you're, you're talking to yourself a little bit, you know, the, whether you're praying in your head or, or speaking out loud, which I, I found I really prefer speaking out loud because it does feel like you're talking to someone. It's different than your just daily mono, inner monologue kind of thing. Um, but yeah, how like, hey, there's a, a difficulty of with private personal prayer, with prayer in your head of drawing that distinction between when am I actually talking to God? Am I being heard? Is this is there anything to this? And and you go all the way back to the start, you know, of course, Adam and Eve got to talk straight to God, but you have that term calling on the name of the Lord, which, you know, talks about worship a little bit, but, um, and you see that throughout Genesis, like Abraham, others got to talk straight to God or, or Jacob with the visions and things like that. But, and even through Moses, but when you come to prayer, when you come to somebody like David, when you come to somebody, and I think that's kind of the most helpful thing for defining what prayer is, is looking at the Psalms. And it really is pouring your heart out to God, sharing your thoughts with God, asking requests of God, or, or just thanking God, praising God, being grateful to God and, and all of the things that it can be. And so I, I think when we collectively come together to pray, you know, when the guy gets up at church and says, you know, let's let's bow in prayer that can feel more like we're doing something, but sometimes privately it does, it, it can feel a little self-contained. I, I don't know about if you guys struggle with that too. I've, I've always thought prayer in Christianity specifically as a religion is so unique and so interesting. And obviously I'm not, I've never practiced any other religion or anything like that, but I've always thought the, the concept of we believe in an all knowing, all powerful being that saved us from sin and we get to talk to him we get to to you know do something by which he listens to us and not just listens to us but wants to listen to us that concept in and of itself has always just fascinated me and i think that's so interesting and again fairly unique to christianity um the fact that once again as jack was saying god wants us to to share our thoughts to tell us to to talk about how our day went to to pour out what's on what's on our mind. I think that's the other interesting thing about prayer is there's so many different elements to it. Or I guess I should say there should be a lot of different elements to it. Obviously, you read the Psalms and a lot of it is simply David just praising God for who he is, you know, the his listing off his characteristics and his traits and acknowledging how powerful, how mighty, how incredible he is. And I definitely think that there needs to be elements of that in our prayer um you know just going to god saying god i really need x y and z could you take care of that for me thanks that's probably not a good way to pray so there's praise but then there's also many places in scripture where it talks about bringing our requests and petitions to god like he wants us to do that you know i've used the analogy before of like the you know all three of us are parents and our our kids that just ask question after question after question after question and eventually it's like okay just give me a break i need i i i need i need a minute to not answer your questions god never does that with us god wants to hear the questions he wants to hear the the requests and so there's that um again just just sharing our thoughts with god i think is such an interesting concept and i do think that that is that is a huge element of prayer that to joe's point feels strange it feels awkward it feels weird like you're just sitting there again if you're by yourself talking out loud or it feels strange so yeah I, but i think it's fascinating i think it's something i think that's the reason though that people struggle with it is because we feel like maybe we're not saying enough that we should be you know maybe using better words but as far as what is prayers we're talking to this as we're answering this question we got another interesting question that i'm gonna let joe get to here in a second um i think there's so many different elements of it that if you don't practice it if you're not if it's something that's not a daily part of your routine, it does become very easy to just, you know, do the thank you for this day. Thank you for our blessings. Be with the sick. Help me with this. In Jesus' name, amen. 
What I find interesting is Hebrews 4. This is not on the outline, so I'm already going off outline. Um, is Hebrews 4, us boldly approaching God with confidence. We know the veil is split at Jesus' death on the cross. We now have access to God that they didn't have. So my question is, did the Israelites have the ability to pray in their head to God? Did they even know to pray in their head to God? Is that unique to Christianity where, as we talk about what is prayer, you know, it's it's ascending our, our hearts and our minds to God, right? We're giving over our worries and anxieties. And like you said, praise, thanksgivings, all those things. We're giving that up to God. Yes, sometimes it feels like that conversation with self, but it's very much with a God. I don't know if people envision God figure, whatever it is in mind, if they're just throwing it out to the universe, quote unquote, as people might say. Um, so that, that part is a little bit tricky in terms of like, I just always picture this is I'm handing it up to the throne of God and it's kind of this being of light. I'd love to know what other people envision when they do pray, but fellas, I'll ask you, we now have a high priest. We now know, and this is kind of going to get us into this next question of the members of, of the Godhead, how they work. We know that Jesus is our mediator. We know the Holy Spirit is our mediator in a different way. And we've heard the illustration of kind of the postman, you know, delivering the prayer and one translating the kind of the prayer itself or, or the letter that you're handing. And that's kind of the roles of the Godhead and then God grants it. But we know with Jesus, we can boldly approach God. Do you think that the Israelites were not able to, because we see David, we see other Israelites seemingly pray to God. What's different now? than was back then and how what, what in in terms of us approaching god with confidence and with the veil being split us going into the holy of holies with jesus as our high priest this was so interesting i'll hand it to jack in a second i don't know that i have a solid answer but you think about some of the big names in the old testament obviously moses talked to god pretty easily abraham you mentioned david as well did the common man israelite have that ability i think of like in the old testament when it talks about the israelites crying out to god um, to save them from slavery, you know, things like that, where it's like, okay, were they praying or were they just kind of, I don't know. I mean, you would think that if they were crying out to God, that there was, there was, there was some way of, they were expressing, you know, uh, discontentment with their situation, crying out to their God. I mean, that kind of sounds like prayer to me, but at the same time, it does seem like Jesus adds an element, um, for us today as Christians that did not exist back in the old Testament. And maybe it is the more individualized, again, sharing thoughts with God, approaching the throne room of God that maybe the Israelites didn't have. Maybe it was a more generic thing. I'm not really sure, Jack. What are what are your thoughts on on that very interesting question Joe asked? I think there's that. The other thing that stands out to me is Jesus when he's teaching the model prayer, of course, in Matthew 6. And, and I mean, really throughout the Gospels, calls God Father. There's not a lot of that in the Old Testament of, of viewing God as a exactly father. exactly where I was going to go. Yep. There's a couple of times, you know, where God refers to himself as a, a father to them, but the the people themselves did not bow their heads and say our, our father our heavenly father and in a sense he is their father and, and so jesus wasn't introducing a new concept but a new way of addressing him uh and, and where he talks about prayer of your father in heaven knows what you need before you ask and what father you know if, if his son asked for bread would give him a stone and and you know how much more will your heavenly father and so just to think of him as a loving generous father who cares benevolent. for you yeah benevolent you know caring and and concerned and listening and, and all of the the aspects of a good father uh is a, a new testament concept now of course you see david praying to him in, in belief that he that god cares but i think there's that you know the the mediation uh the spirit the the romans a the spirit helping us you know with the groanings too deep for words um I, yeah it, it does seem like there's a a, a closer a, a ability to draw closer i guess Jack's right. taking all my uh, all my points because that's where I was going to go in Romans eight is those well, men David you know Elijah we see men that are filled with the Spirit it talks about back then but those were on either specific occasions or for very specific men whereas we know all Christians are endowed with the Holy Spirit uh, Acts two thirty eight and the Spirit is the one that translates again kind of takes this message and goes here's what he really needs that's that's the way I interpret Romans eight is with the groanings too deep for words I'm a mere human being that is too stupid to really know what I need and what I want. The spirit clearly is not. And so the spirit is taking this message to God in a way, or Jesus kind of, I think is the messenger, so to speak, taking it up to God. I don't know that they had that back then, other than to your point, Will, of a few special people that did have that connection with God. And I do think the father part coming in of that closeness and that tightness, 
we now have what David had. Like the average Christian can now have what only the elite, so to speak, in the Old Testament. Yeah. That's the best explanation I'd have. Well, the the other thing that's interesting is you go to Luke twelve or Luke eleven. Matthew 6 does not include this, but in Luke 11, it came to pass as he was praying in a certain place, verse 1, when he sees that one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also ta taught his disciples. And so to me, that does serve as an indication that even if prayer was a concept, because I mean, these if it was his disciples, these would have been Jewish boy or Jewish men, people that would have grown up under the law. So again, kind of similar to those in the Old Testament. Even if prayer was a concept, it clearly was not a very big concept to them or something that was very well known because they needed Jesus to teach them how to do it. They needed Jesus to, again, once again, add that other element of, okay, I know I'm supposed to pray. I know the Pharisees do it, but how how, how am I really supposed to do it? And so I think that adds an interesting element too. Well, well consider the law. How much do we see about prayer in the law? We see coming to God right, with, with praises. We, we see a lot of things like that. We don't see a whole lot as to how to pray within the law. So when Jesus is coming on the Sermon on the Mount, you do get the sense that would have been, and to Jack's point, especially about the Father part, fairly revelatory for them. Because we look at it and go, okay, that's the Lord's Prayer. Obviously, it's deep, but at the same time, it's kind of how we pray. We pray for our food, and we pray for forgiveness, and we pray for things like that. Okay, that makes sense. I don't think that was a concept, to your point, like, teach us how to pray. Teach us what, we, what that ought mm -hmm. to look like. I don't think it's a concept that they understood. And so I know that, again, that's that's a detour going off, but I want to bring it back to Joe the put question together that I had, which two is, pages of outline and then is adding more stuff yeah, to extra it. Extra stuff, yeah. <laughs> oh, man. But these are the, this is why, man, we can get two parts out of pr prayer because it's so deep. It's so fascinating. So many good questions. Here's another one. We talk about the members of the Godhead. Again, I think the, the Holy Spirit translates. Uh, I think Jesus is the messenger. This is Hebrews 4, right? He's delivering. He's our high priest on, on behalf of God. He goes into the Holy of Holies for us, so to speak. And kind of fights on our behalf is what it seems like. God the Father seems to be the one that it's in his will that these things take place. And we see this throughout scripture, that God's will. So God the Father seems to be the one that's granting prayer, so to speak. But all three play a role. Jack, you got into this. I'm going to let you speak on this because I know you did an entire episode on dogma about this. Can we pray to different members of the Godhead? Some people get very, very weird about it. And some people say, well, that's just a denominational I was thing. Say, this, this was Jesus. a controversy in the Church of Christ there for a while, like yes, a pretty big deal. Yeah. Yes, it was. Um, so, yeah, pray, like saying, starting out a prayer, dear Jesus, I, I think a lot of people are uncomfortable with that. They say there's not um, the, the example. Our Precedent. example is our, our father who art in heaven, um, except I mean, the Bible right at the end of it is says, come Lord Jesus. Well, that's a request you're making of Christ. And, um, you know, there's there's other scriptures. the same thing in Acts seven. Right. Right. You know, looking up and seeing him. And so um there there's more example of that than you think the other thing is it, it's very difficult with the trinitarian ideas of god the father god the son god the holy spirit that they are all god but we're, we're trying to keep them separate but not separate them you know like uh, all of the difficulty of holding that concept together it, it is a challenging thing and so you know i it's trying to maintain the distinction that is in there when people say don't pray to them but on the other hand when you're praying to God, you are being heard by all three. You're, it, it is God. And so you're not only praying to the Father, although most of the example is to the Father. And so I, I think it's something that I get where people are coming from with saying that because there is just so much of that, that it's to the Father you're speaking to. But there are other examples. And um, I don't know. I, I think it's something not to be dogmatic about. I think it's something to... Uh, maybe not take too far because of the ambiguity in there, I guess I would say. I don't know that this is legit, but I've always heard that people in crisis pray to Jesus, you know, in a, in a car wreck, you know, instead of dear God, like in a crisis moment, they call out for Jesus, which I don't know if that's legitimate or not. That's what I've heard. Um, I think that is, if that is legit, I think that's very interesting that like the personal connection with Jesus almost feels more needed in that moment as opposed to God. And I think that's a maybe a poor way of looking at it because we have a personal connection with all of them. Talking but about, I like, think that's Carrie Underwood here. <laughs> what? Not quite. Uh... Take the wheel. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> but seriously, I think that is like, that's what I've heard in a car wreck is people will blurt out like, Jesus, please help them. Why? Well, again, I would say because he's more of a recognizable figure, so to speak, where God is, you know, an eternal light and, and tougher to approach, quote unquote. I don't know. I don't know fully what to so, make of it, but I agree with me, you that maybe being dogmatic on it is, I don't think the, yeah, I don't think that's the best approach. Let, let, let me add one thing, because I definitely agree that the dog, 
the dog being dogmatic about that does has never made sense to me. Let me add one more passage of scripture, John 14. So obviously this is right after he washes the disciples' feet. He's just told them I'm the way, the truth, and the life. I want to start in verse 10. It's going to be five verses, 10 through 14, where Jesus is making the point that he is, quote unquote, in the Father and the Father is in him. I'll start in verse 10 of John 14. Do you not believe that I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does the works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. And whatever you ask in my name, that I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. I think that's kind of interesting. That Jesus, you know, saying, "Hey, you know, me, me and my, me and the Father are, are kind of one." There, obviously, that's the point he's making to the disciples, and he tells them, "If you ask anything in my name, essentially, I'll, I'll do it." And so, again, I just wanted to add that element for those who would say, "Never, no, never praying to Jesus under any circumstances." Um, I think I'd, I'd be interested to hear the response to to that section in John fourteen. It is interesting what they'd say is we pray to the Father, and then in Jesus' name, Amen. We always say it, but is that not calling on Jesus in that? Moment? Well, that would be praying to the father with Jesus with authority, authority as the Jesus. mediator. Okay. It, and it's kind of right. And okay. some people wouldn't even say this, but spirit inside us, Jesus beside us, father in front of us is kind of the, the depiction there. Um, and so that you are again, keeping that line of separation without separating. It. It's a Trinitarian thing again, that is very complex. And I don't know. I, I think again, being super dogmatic about Trinitarian things like that, other than just outright heresies is, uh, you're you're oversimplifying a very complex thing. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and move us into the next question. And Joe, I'll start with you here. So why is prayer important? We talked about what is prayer. Um, why is prayer important? It might kind of seem like a odd question, like an obvious question. We probably won't spend as much time on this one as we did the first one and as we will in the next couple. But Joe, why is prayer important? Why is this something that we as Christians are expected to do? Well, uh, first things first, we're told on multiple occasions uh, to pray. Ephesians 6, 18, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the spirit. And with this in view, be on alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints and pray on my behalf. Um, and, and continues. We have Philippians 4, 6, which I'll get to, um, which is be anxious for nothing, of course, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your request be made known to God. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Uh, lots and lots of prayer throughout scripture where we're seeing the people of God. And that's, that's kind of to the old Testament side. We see people's or God's people have always talked with or walked with God from the very beginning. We see with Adam, we see with Abraham, we see with Moses, with Elijah, Daniel prays three times a day. Uh, we have precedent set in scripture from the most holy men of the Bible. They're praying. The, the people that are on God's side are talking to God. They're walking with God in this day by day approach. Daniel, I think is one of the best examples of this where God may not be, and yes, in the dreams and such, I suppose it is, but he's not walking with God the way maybe Moses did or the way Adam did, of course. But the three times a day is keeping God top of mind. He's very much as a, a he's not a Christian at the time, he's a good Israelite. Um, clearly, he thought it was important, as did pretty much every other figure. Paul is constantly in prayer. I mean, every single, he starts basically every letter saying, I pray this for you. Well, I made this point on Sunday which I think will be on focus or uh, Patreon for the uh, sermon last week or whenever we're putting it out. But um, how many churches does Paul pray for? Well, we know the Roman church, the Corinthian church, the Ephesian church, the Philippian church. I mean, he's got all these different churches, Thessalonica, everything else. And he's praying for each of them and he's praying specific things for each of them. And he's praying for specific people in each of them. Do you know how much prayer that is? Like that's a significant amount of prayer when you're praying for this many names and this many things for this many churches and this is just the stuff he records. How much more is he praying? So the precedent is pretty strong. Prayer is very important. The people that are closest to God are those that are praying people. I think it's very difficult to make the case that a Christian can go and basically just pray for his three meals a day um, with nothing more involved in his prayers other than thanking God for the food that he has and have him be a strong Christian. I don't think there's a correlation to no prayer and a strong Christian at all uh, throughout scripture. So why is prayer important? There's a bazillion and one examples is what I would say. Of people being drawn closer to God, I'll add that. Of people being drawn closer to God through prayer. Right. Well, I mean, it's, it's the two-way system of he talks to you through the word, you talk to him through daily prayer, and, and both of them should be a 
part of your daily life of meditating on the word, getting in the word uh, so that you can hear from him. Uh, and I mean, just so many times it's I wish I could hear from God. Well, you can just read the Bible. Uh, and uh, again, the faith of knowing, OK, now he's going to hear me. He can hear what I say and, you know, bringing things to his feet. And, and the more you pray, especially praying and we'll get into some of this probably a little later, but praying in his will, praying with an open heart and mind to just put the cares before him and not demand things of him, but to just say, this is how it is. And you, I'm, I'm handing this to you, casting my anxieties on you. Then you see him at work, shaping it in, in the direction you're supposed to go. And, and you learn his character that way. Well, and the other thing too, and I'm not sure if this one went on on uh, focus plus the sermon cast or not, but I just preached a sermon on prayer as well from Matthew six. And one of the things that I pointed out that, I mean, really is, is, uh, you know, obvious from the new Testament is that, Prayer, at, it draws you closer to God because of how much more you're communicating with him. You think about every relationship in your life that you're really uh, of somebody you're really close to. Odds are you probably communicate with them a good bit. And all the people in your life that you're not all that close to, that maybe you want to be closer to, you probably don't communicate with them very much. It's, it's a simple equation of the more you communicate with somebody, the closer you're going to be. And so that's why I feel like we have a lot of Christians who don't really have strong relationships with God. It very much is a... Come to church, check off my box, believe, you know, profess the belief in God, but there's not really much more depth to my Christianity. There's not much more depth to my relationship with God. I think a lot of it could probably be pointed back to their prayer life because there is not a lot of communication going on with God. It is very much a, let me pray before dinner. Maybe I'll say a 20 second prayer at the end of the night as I'm half asleep, falling asleep, as we've talked about before. I, I, again, I think that's you. You draw closer to God through through more constant prayer, through more continual prayer. Just again, the simple simple fact of the more you communicate, the the closer you are. And again, I think this that is something that you could probably look to as maybe the a symptom of why so many people don't have strong relationships with God is because those communication channels don't stay open. It is very much a after you know before my before my dinner and maybe a couple times a, a week. Other than that. Prayer is important because the more communicate, the more we do, the more we communicate with God, the closer we are to Him. And I think anybody who has an active prayer life would probably echo that. Like you do feel closer to God the more. I mean, because all of us have probably gone through seasons of, of prayer where we were really engaged, doing it often, and maybe busier times where we weren't and we knew we should have been doing more. You feel closer to God the more you communicate with Him. So that would be another thing why I would add that of why it's important. There's also, it is a set. I mean, we're we're sitting here on computers scattered by miles talking, seeing each other face to face, just stuff that was really hard to imagine when I was born, this kind of technology that's accessible to everyone. Everybody can do this in their own home. And, and you don't think twice about it. We get on and, and it's not like every single day you're like, wow, I can, I can video chat with people all over the world. Like you just don't think about it. Well, it's kind of the same thing of like, you can talk to the God who created the universe with the, with his voice. And, and put your cares on him. You can ask him for help. You can just thank him for things. I mean, just uh, that should be right, That's what I was away. thinking. It was the, the fascination of it. Yeah. Right. And and again, anything that you do every day, that you're going to lose that a little bit. But try not to too much because that's what drives you back to it. It's like, wow, I get to do this. This is insane. This is incredible. It is a sad thing that it's kind of become the cliche preacher thing of read and pray. Read and pray. Oh, yeah, I know, preacher. Thanks. There's such power in that. Don't let that become a cliche thing. We do get to approach the God of the universe. We get to let him know of our, and, and to your point, Will, it's not just a one-sided conversation. As Jack said, it is the two way of getting the word. But to your point of like, when I'm in a really good season of prayer, when I really feel like I'm connected to God, God's not giving me messages. He's not telling me things. But at the same time, I feel very much the spirits leading in my life, like way more than I do when I'm disconnected from him. That's the answer to prayer. That's me connecting with him. So I would say the last thing that I had on the outline and then we're going to get into because we're already kind of answering this a little bit, but it does remind us of our dependence on him. We absolutely are dependent. We see this in Philippians 4 of I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In that context, it's Paul going, I've been through boom, 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 this, 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 this. But I know I can do it because of Christ. I know I can do it because it, it does remind us of like we are fully dependent on God. We have nothing outside of him. Prayer aligns us with that. But the question that really kind of lingers on everybody's mind, we're already answering it some. Yes, we do believe that this is the case. But a lot of people are going to ask, does it actually work? Is it effective? It, we know of James 5.16. Does it change of things, really? Does it yeah. change things? Yes. Right. And James 5.16, the effective prayer of a righteous man accomplishes much. 
okay, well, that's in the context of Elijah. I'm not Elijah in my righteousness. So does God answer my prayers? Does he listen to me? And I would say, just kicking this off, I'll throw it to you guys. I think we have to define when we say, does it work or is it effective? Does it change things? Define work, define effective, define change. We have to ask, what is the purpose of our prayers? Are we looking to actively, you know, if, if it's effective and uh, if the desire Change of the, the prayer of is things. to, right. And I think that's what people are looking at is, which we will get to, does it change the outcome? First and foremost, prayer is about aligning our will with God's, aligning yeah. where we are with God. I think that's, we kind of have the God as a genie in, in a bottle, so to speak. We'll pull him out when we need him and, and, you know, God, give me this and give me that. And there's the classic facing the giants every single time something's needed. It's like, oh, he gets a new truck. Oh, the football team wins. Oh, oh, wow. This is amazing. God just answered every prayer. That's not how it works because there are, there are a lot of good hearted Christians. There was not a single thing in that movie that went wrong. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, they did lose the game, but then the team was cheating. And so they're like, come on right, guys, right. come on. And it gives this impression that everything you pray for, God will say yes to. It's the health and wealth gospel, the Joel Osteen. God's just waiting to bless you. Like, so yeah, he was waiting to bless Israel too while he sent them into captivity for 70 years. It doesn't always work out in that way, the way we want it to. But if that is our conceptualization of prayer, which is I pray and he gives, we've made God a genie and not the all-powerful God of the universe. Well, what I think is interesting about this question is essentially what we're asking is, does God step in? Does God step in and change the outcome? If I've got if 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 a if my if I found out tomorrow that one of my kids has cancer and I fervently prayed for them for the next two months, based on my prayer, would God step in necessarily? And not even necessarily would he, but could he? Could God step in because of my prayer and heal my child? Not because, you know, not. Because he already knew that it was going to go away or because he was already playing on healing them. But because of my prayer, that's the, that's the interesting thing. Once again, praying for a new job. Me and my wife are looking for a house right now. Praying that we'll find a house. Like, does God step in on those things or are those things already set in stone? And we got into this a lot with our Calvinism episode, actually, kind of the predestination thing. But that, to me, I think that's what we're asking is, does God step in and change the outcome of things? Or because was it already set in was it already set in stone that my child was going to get healed or that we were going to find a house or that I was going to get the job promotion or any of those things? Because if it was already set in stone, the logical side of our brains tells us, well, then what's really the point of prayer? And so you have to, if if you believe that, you know, these things are not set in stone, then you have to acknowledge that prayer does something. But then we're not exactly as we talked about in that episode, we're not open theists where God's just kind of along for the ride. Boy, we'll see what happens. I mean, there is a level of God is overall. Obviously, he knows all. Right. Um, but that's tough to square with scripture because it's it, or it's tough to square with prayer because it's easier to have like prayer becomes more powerful almost in a open theism type thing of God goes, yeah, yeah, I will grant that. And as it goes, because everything's not set. But when you say God's will is set, then you go, is he really going to listen to me? And so there's two separate thoughts on this. So, and, so what do you think on it, Joe? I'm curious. Well, uh, let, me, let me get to the two separate <laughs> thoughts <laughs> because <laughs> Jack and I, I think Jack and I may disagree on this a little bit, um, but he makes very good points. And so I'm going to let him get to the one side. Well, you go ahead and give the wrong side and then I'll. <laughs> <laughs> I knew that was coming. <laughs> sure, sure. So there's a C.S. Lewis idea and he has a book on prayer, how to pray. It's a fantastic book. Um, and one of the points he makes is when God's laying out the foundation of the earth, foundation of everything, he knew back then, bazillion years ago, that you were going to pray in this moment, and maybe he decided to grant that prayer. If God knows all, then he looked ahead. Into, the earth is in not a bazillion years wisdom. old, by the way. Joe does not believe Yeah, yeah, yeah. no, no, no. <laughs> Just to no. clear that up. <laughs> 6,000 years, Sorry. yes. But in before time existed, when he's right, laying right. out, is all I'm saying, yes. So maybe I shouldn't use years as that. <laughs> Our conceptualization of eternity is just Wrong a bazillion, measurement. a bazillion, bazillion yeah. years. Yeah. Um, no, but... Before the 6,000, 10,000, whatever it is, he's laying out everything, infinite wisdom, infinite time. And he says, you know, Joe's going to pray for this on April, whatever, you know, we're recording this on April 9th, um, 2024. And because he prayed for that, I, I want to grant that. And so I'm going to, you know, work at my, in, in his, again, infinite wisdom, that prayer i'm going to answer that prayer with a yes and that's to help and then if he answers with a no it's because he goes okay on the timeline i know in two years if i answer it yes today then 
this isn't going to come about and I need this to come about. Therefore, it's a no today, but maybe a yes later, or it's a no today because it would ultimately. So do that harm. belief does kind of already believe it's set in stone. It does believe it's set in stone, but he set it in stone at the beginning. He knew whether you would pray or not. And that's why people pray is because it's not in a real time thing as much as he knew this was going to happen. However long ago that is and in, ter- in eternity before. Up until, I mean, Jack and I have gone around and he's kind of brought about a different point as we've been going through Exodus, which I'm going to let him get into in a second. The second side of it, I think that makes a very strong case as to why we as Christians should pray. Because a lot of people go, why pray at all? It's already set in stone. It doesn't matter. It's not going to change God's mind. Maybe it did all that time ago. Maybe he knew you were going to be righteous. The problem with that is you do get into some Calvinism of like, okay, has he determined who's righteous and who's not? There's other questions that are or very who's difficult gonna pray to answer. Or who's going to pray and who's not, right. Yeah. Correct. But he does know essentially that he knew you were going to say that prayer and he knew that he wanted to grant that prayer for you in that time. So that's kind of how I believed. There are some challenges to that though. Jack, get us into your side of it, which brings us kind of to Exodus 32. I'll play tiebreaker here. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. Exodus 32 with Moses pleading to God, like don't destroy your people after the golden calf. Right. Because a lot of times people bring up the Abraham bargaining over Sodom and Gomorrah with Lot. But at no point did God have to change anything in that, you know, other than, okay, this number is fine. This number is fine. Because he also knew, you know, uh, basically, I'm right. Totally right. Yeah, I'm, he's a humoring Abraham, you know, like to show Abraham, no, it really is that bad. It really does deserve everything it's about to get. Whereas with the Moses one, uh, he tells Moses, all right, they're down there worshiping a golden calf. Uh, he says, I'm going to kill all of them and start over with you. And Moses kind of pleads. Well, hold on. Uh, the Egyptians are going to see that. And, you know, what are they going to think of, of you as a god? which is an interesting appeal, uh, but also, hey, you got the yeah. promises to the fathers like this is uh, uh, kind of remember, which, again, starting over with Moses would not have negated the promises to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob, because it's still through the same line, still through the same family. He could have started over uh, and you kind of wonder, like, man, would, what, maybe it would have gone a little well, better. I mean, I know, again, it was always going to lead to Christ. It was always going to lead to man's failure, but it was such a, as he said, an obstinate generation. Uh, that ended up having to fall in the wilderness and all that. And the funny thing is, Moses comes down the mountain, and when he gets to look at it, he's like, yeah, okay, no, we do need to start killing these people. And, and they do. They kill 3,000 of them. But um, there is that idea of Moses kind of talking God off the ledge, talking God uh, down from from wiping everybody out. And so the question is, did he actually change God's mind? And the text is uh, basically explicitly says he, God changed his mind. God relented. Um, Um, and yeah, and, and didn't do what he was planning to do, which is to kill everybody. And so the question is, was that for show or did he, does it mean what it says when it says he changed his mind and he relented? And I think a big part of that, and, and this doesn't necessarily contradict Joe's like looking down the corridor. Well, not Joe's, but CS Lewis is looking down the corridors of time thing, but that God's respect for Moses was such that he, and and some I heard somebody argue one time that essentially a prophet was somebody who was a junior member of the divine council, essentially a human member of getting to talk to God, getting to argue mm-hmm. to God, getting to help God shape his plans. Because you see that with um, the Ahab and Micaiah thing, which we brought up on that previous podcast, where God is kind of checking in with the divine council, like, well, how do we want to handle this and, and letting them make suggestions as to what they're going to do? Um, and, and that Moses and Abraham, those that were friends of God kind of had that sway where they could go in before God and say, actually, let's do it this way. And God says, okay. Um, and so allowing for that, um, I don't, again, I don't think that contradicts the thing that you said. I think yours is, or the Lewis thing is a a tidy explanation for it, but it's a tidy explanation of something that might not need to be tidied up it might be a little more complex and beyond our understanding but it maybe it is that way i don't know i I don't know that i'm arguing something terribly different the struggle that i have with that one specifically is correct me if i'm wrong moses was not from the tribe of judah correct so all of the theoretically all of the things that are coming before of the the promise made to judah genesis 50 all these things would have kind of been broken if god had decided to start over with moses like yeah, the, the lineage of Christ would have continued because it would have been that. But there's all these blessings that Isaac gave to pass down to his kids that would have never come to fruition because they've only been through Moses. So it seems like, I mean, God's clearly aware of that. Everything works out perfectly. So I've been an advocate for like, yeah, it seems like God has the ability to because multiple times it kind of talks about God. I shouldn't say multiple, but at least that occasion, I think there's at least another one where God changed his mind. Um, 
Which because you don't want to get the, into a position where you're arguing that God was just in a fit of rage and he forgot that Moses wasn't of the tribe of Judah and all these things. Right. Right. You know, nobody's so gonna argue. Maybe that. he did, so, yeah, maybe that he didn't make it tough. Yeah. So that's that's, that's the that's, one. Yeah, it's it's a tough explanation or it's a tough question. Yeah, Will, do you have any any thoughts on it? No, I I have kind of always leaned towards the idea that the quote unquote, and as we discussed in the Calvinism episode, um, kind of the big items on the, the bullet points, so to speak on the timeline, like God has pretty well set those in stone and there's nothing that's going to change those. Uh, obviously Jesus and, you know, a lot of various things throughout uh, the Bible and maybe throughout history, but about whether or not I'm going to get the job promotion. I don't know that he's necessarily set that in stone and that my prayer could change that or that he's going to heal my, you know, dad from his cancer. Again, like, I do find it a little bit more realistic to think that maybe he has not mapped that out. He knows, but maybe he has not mapped that out. And then my prayer, you know, where my, the ferventness of my prayer, whether or not I'm righteous, which we'll get to here in just a second. And I'm praying those things. I have, I have always tended to believe that that might have some sway and that's not as set in stone, which I don't know where that fits into what you guys said, but that's always kind of been what I believed is again, the really big points, the, the bullet points, the boilerplate stuff on the timeline is set in stone, but call it the more minor things are not. If that oh, makes okay. Sense. So, so I'm going to throw in a, an off outline thing here as well. We've all known a lot of people who prayed for somebody to be healed. And even against the, all the odds and the doctors, you know, what they said was possible. There was a healing and there's been a lot of people we prayed for who died. Um, right. And, and that's where a lot of people lose faith is. This is all random. God is not actually over this. It's just some people get better and some people don't. Uh, you know, like I asked and they asked. And of course, the faith healers are always doing the well. You just didn't have enough faith. If you had more faith, you know, grandpa wouldn't have died. Well, there's an obvious point at which there's no promise that you can pray people out of death. I mean, like we would have 2000 year old people if that's how it worked. Um, and, and so everyone's going to die at some point. But is it a matter of faith? Is it a matter of the, the, the righteousness of the people doing the praying? Is it a matter of, um, and I think just the most simple thing is it's not always in God's will that that person continue on, but man, you see some really tragic things of, of children passing away or, or young adults, people with families, you know, thing, bad things happening. And well, where was prayer? And that is a, a question people really come to. And what, what does Hezekiah come into this as well? Is somebody that I thought of somebody right. who, you know, was going to die, prayed for additional time. Like, did God set that in stone all the way back? Like, I don't know. That That's just in a very interesting, like, it seems to me, Hezekiah, quote unquote, influenced God through his prayer, through his petition to extend his life. See, I think that God does have more laid out. Um, and I've used this before, I think on a podcast, I certainly preached on it. You know, I prayed 10,000 times for God to take away my porn addiction when I was 13, 14, 15, 16 years old. And it was no, 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 no. Like he didn't miraculously take it away. First off, I had not humbled myself fully in the way that I should have, which is going to get us into this next point of prayer of a righteous man. But second off, if he had taken it away at 14 years old, miraculously, I wouldn't do what I do every single day. So, which is to get to counsel people out of porn addiction. God knew exactly what he was doing in answering no to my prayer. I thought God didn't care. I thought he was just content to let me, you know, wallow basically in my sin. Of course he wasn't. But that's what at your 16 year old mind conceptually speaks like he doesn't answer my prayer. He absolutely did. He had a much bigger plan. That's what tells me God's laid out a lot. Um, if he knows just I'm not going to miraculously take it away. I need you to humble yourself, do whatever it takes. But then also I'm going to use this to my glory, which is kind of the, the thorn in the flesh side of things. But you get to the righteous side of it, which is real what quick, does it actually quick. mean? Go for it. I was just say I love that point, especially when it comes to your story, just to because we're we've already demonstrated we don't really care about the timer at this point or the outline to present the alternative what do you do with the person who is the the exact opposite of your story they earnestly pray for their parent to who ha again i'm going to keep using the cancer analogy to be healed they're not healed and they turn their back on god forever and they choose to you know go down the other path that once i mean to me that's the reverse of your story so what do you what would you do with with a situation like that both take faith and understanding God is at, at play in a much bigger way. We would like to think that God is not a respecter of persons. That means he doesn't really respect me. And he did like in that way. We don't know that he took them for a very specific reason. This is where the faith in God has to come in. If God had a reason for why that took place, 
we don't understand the reason because we're not God, but there's a reason why. And yes, it's very easy for me. I haven't like lost a child or I haven't lost a, a very close loved one. So of course, in my naivete and, and, and whatnot, like it's easy for me to go, well, yeah, just have faith. It's insanely, insanely difficult, especially mixing with the grieving process and everything else in that moment. But I do think those who come through it stronger are those who recognize God had a much bigger plan involved. And you go, how does God have a bigger plan when I've been praying for my unrepented parent, you know, my my uh, non-Christian parent to come to him and then the non-Christian parent dies? However old they were, God gave them that many years. They turn their back on God time and again. Yeah, there's a free God will element to this, right? God doesn't. Yeah, exactly. And God doesn't owe you anything. He doesn't owe you anything. My point in my story is if you allow it, if you humble yourself and allow for, you know, really recognizing like, why did God do this? God always has a reason. And there are people that will never find out the reason. I was fortunate enough to, I think, find out the reason as to why he told me no that many times. There are people that will never find out the reason. Doesn't mean God doesn't have one. Uh, doesn't have a reason. He does. It just, you may not be privy to what that is. But this is the importance of like recognizing there are trillions of tendrils. Think about how many decisions, there are 8 billion people on the planet. How many decisions are made every single day from the average person? Tens of thousands of decisions every single day. Okay, 8 billion people. This is every day. This is one day. God is aware of all of those things and he's aware of how all of those things affect time. The thought of us being able to understand, it's kind of the, the butterfly effect, you know, flaps its wings, causes a tsunami. This is, I think, how prayer works and how our decisions work. So when somebody dies, we go, God wasn't listening to me. There is some person in Africa that comes to Christ because your parents died. That sounds really flippant to say, but legitimately, like, I do think that's how it works is God knows how everything is affected. And because this person died on the way to the funeral home, they happened to see a billboard that happened to say such and such, which caused them to do X, Y, and Z, which caused them. To... We have no concept of how delicate this this is so when those things happen you don't know what was triggered that could essentially change the entire course of the world because your parents died you just don't know so that's the faith i have in god is to say yeah he's over that i can't begin to understand i don't even know the decisions i make on a day day by day basis he's aware of eight billion yeah the the, the faith has to come in to recognize there is that but i do want to get to the righteous question what does it tangibly mean? Because this is another thing that we add in is how much weightier in the tendrils of time and everything else, how much weightier is the righteous persons? It does talk about the effective prayer of a righteous man. We know that our sins, Isaiah 59, 1 and 2, right? As sin separates us from God, his hand isn't so short that it can't save, but we do separate ourselves from God through our sin. Um, does God just... Does he hear only the prayers of the righteous or does he hear everybody's prayer? Or is it just that they have a they make more of a dent, so to speak, in like God is more willing to answer their prayers than somebody else's prayers. Because this is where the C.S. Lewis, kind of the corridors of time falls apart a little bit, I think, is, is he really, if he's laid out everything, then is it that he sees that you're going to be righteous and in that moment he goes, I really want to make this work because you're a righteous guy, whereas everybody else is, I don't really care about making it work, I'll do what I want. Like, that's a little bit of the discussion that I have. So what are your guys' thoughts on that? Well, I, I I don't see a problem with that actually uh, that it, that okay. it would work that way. Uh, but it also could be that the righteous are naturally more aligned with his will already, and so they get there. You know, you brought up the the Elijah thing, and it explicitly says there in James five of he was a man with a nature like ours, and so it's not like he's a, a super powered human like we might think. Sure. But there's a righteousness uh, you have here the the matter of First Peter three uh, seven where husbands who aren't treating their wives properly, God is telling them you're not going to be heard until you get that right. And it goes along with what Jesus said in Matthew five of, if you've got a problem with somebody else, don't come worship, don't come offer a sacrifice, go make that right. Because, and to bring in another one, first John, you can't hate your brother and, and say you love God. Um, and, and so all of those things, like you got to be right with your fellow man, treating your wife, right. Or, or whatever that uh, can affect how God hears you. But I, I do think, the Davids, the Moseses, the the Abrahams, the you know Elijahs, or whatever, that there is a a weight that God puts on prayer. But on the other hand, you've got a Cornelius who's not yet a Christian, but he's an honest seeker, and you have the promise from Jesus: whoever asks, seeks, knocks. You know, will be, those things will be answered to them. Um, and, and so I think there's that side of it: of you don't have to be saved to have your prayers heard, but you need to be seeking. But I think the further along you go, you know, I. 
some people's prayers probably move more than than others. I don't have a problem uh, saying that. I don't have a lot to add. I think you summed that up really well. I mean, even verse 15 that we didn't really talk about because the effective fervent prayer of a righteous man is in James 5, 16. Verse 15, James blatantly says, the prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. So I think there's a there's a certain faith element to it as well of how much faith you actually have in your prayer. Are you just, you know, well, I'm really praying for my uh, parent to heal from cancer, but that's just because that's what I'm supposed to do. Or no, like, because that's when he goes into Elijah who earnestly prayed that it would not rain. And then, you know, again, as everything that Jack just said. So I, I agree. I don't have a ton to add to that. I do think it, it makes sense, again, with the First Peter 3 passage of our prayers being hindered if we're not in a right state with God. Yeah, it makes sense that uh, the those who are righteous, those who are seeking, they're going to get a little bit more weight added to their prayers than those who, again, are just doing it flippantly. Or, you know, you think about the person who's living living in open sin and prays before their meals. Is God here in that prayer? The person who is is living with their girlfriend, you know, sleeping together, you know, again, kind of disregarding what God says, and then, and then all of a sudden wants to pray for a job promotion. Like I just, I, I obviously, it seems like common sense wise would tell you there's a little bit less weight to that prayer. Well, this is the this is the difficulty: is did God answer not answer my prayers as a porn addict because I was in the midst of my porn addiction? Is that why He didn't answer? And if I was, but well, then being, being were you honestly praying, seeking to try to get out of it? Which right, I, well, I think I was, and that's where praying to be saved from sin is not the same as what Will's talking about of praying for something else while you're going right, on in the sin. While you're in sin. Right. But this is where a lot of people would get tripped up is I feel like I'm righteous. This is where workspace salvation can easily enter the picture, I would say. Like, I feel like I'm righteous. I think I'm doing the right things, but the one sin maybe that I have, like, that's why God didn't answer my prayer, is because, you know, I I said a lie and I repented of it, but I think that God just didn't answer because of that. I think we can really, if we're not careful, we can really yeah, walk well, a fine line of, right. But I think a lot of people do think that of like, I basically, I have to be perfect in order for God to really answer my prayers. And this is, well, what, what did his parents do wrong? Right. When the Pharisees are asking Jesus, what does parents do wrong? And, and what sin does this man bear because of whatever it is? Like, Hey, the rain falls on the just and the unjust, like the, the tower falls. This is just how life happens, so to speak. It's not just because he was a sinner or whatever else, but this is the mind Yes, it was the Jewish mind. We do the same thing today is, oh, that bad thing must have happened because there's sin. Jack, to your point of the faith healer, you didn't have enough faith. You have an unrepented of sin. And so people comb through their lives going, what's my sin? What did I do? Did I, did I, like God? Did I hurt God? Exactly. All right, Job, what'd you do? What'd you do? And people, again, comb through their lives going, what is in my life that's causing God to not answer my prayers? That's the danger of taking this too far. So there is absolutely a point but I think in this, you, your earnestness. But there's a danger think, in taking say, it too far. I think you know if you have an unrepentant sin in your life. Like again, like I, like I think, think you there, there's a difference in that versus like, man, did I slip up here and there? Like I don't that's not what I'm talking well, about. There's like, even with David the prayer. Oh, for I know that's not what you're talking about. I'm sin. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And and I know that's what you're talking about. I'm just saying I think there's a lot of Christians that have that concept of which I think is a the one and done approach. Right. Yeah. Right. So it's an interesting discussion, and I've often thought about the homeless guy on the side of the, the road. Okay, he's praying. It, it, I don't know why I said homeless. I guess you can be homeless and Christian, but like the, I'm talking about the maybe the degenerate, <laughs> right? The guy who's been kicked to the curb. He's a drunk. He's a whatever it may be. Um, and so let's say he's praying to God. Will God answer his prayers? Well, if God, if it's in alignment with God's will, but then is God answering the prayer of him or is God going along in his will and doing what he would have done anyway? Like, does that guy's prayer have any weight in changing God's mind or in God answering that guy's prayer? Or is it God going, I was going to do it anyway. The other question that I would bring in, and Jack, you have an interesting thought. I think we've gone, we've talked about this of Jesus in the garden. We talk about aligning our will with his, and this will probably be the last thing we get to in, in just the effective part. We're going to have to push to part two, fellas, I think, because um, we got a bunch more on the outline to get to that we have not. And this is going to leave room for more questions, more thoughts, more comments, things like that, um, that... Again, we got a lot more questions that we may already be addressing, but continue to ask your questions uh, as we go to part two. But Jesus is in the garden, not my will, but yours, right? He's praying for that. Um, I'm curious, Jack, I think you have some, maybe some different thoughts because I don't want to get into the a very deep discussion of can Jesus and God have two different wills, you know, um, as, as him being all God, because that's a different discussion for a different time, I suppose. But um as this pertains, you know, you've got the homeless guy, like 
God's will seems to be set in that situation and it seemed to be set in the garden. Now, Jack, I think you have a different view and I don't, again, I don't know that I want to open up into full discussion on the garden, how that works, but this is the exact opposite end. You have the guy who's just an absolute bum who has left his family, a drunk, a horrible man, whatever it is, and he's praying to God and God says, well, you know, I don't think God's going to bend his will to the opposite side and go, I was going to do it, but because you prayed for it, I'm not going to do it anymore. Like, I don't think that's how it works per se, but you go to the other side of Jesus being absolutely perfect. And he seems to be praying, let this cut pass from me. And Hebrews five seems to indicate that in a way God did answer it at the same time, it seems like maybe God didn't answer that prayer. And so what, what a lot of well, people take is answered is it and not in a way that right answered it, not in an affirmative way. Sure. You're saying, yeah. So, Jack, I'm curious your thoughts on that, Of especially as it comes to aligning our will with God's. That is a man who's clearly righteous, but God says no in that way. So it seems obviously God doesn't have to say yes, but I think you do have a different view. And the reason I want to bring it in is this is a tripping up passage, I think, for a lot of people as to even if Jesus prays for it, it doesn't happen. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I think it actually would affirm a lot of what we said here if if that were the case of there's a set will that, you know, and, and that there's sometimes where there's permission to ask for something different. And then there's times where no, there, it, it's going to be what it's going to be. Um, but the issue of, was he actually praying for, um, to not die, I guess, or some people say to, to lighten the suffering. I don't really just see that anywhere in the text, but, uh, there was a really interesting, uh, ep- uh article on Theopolis, I think it's Theopolis.org. The, uh, just, Theopolis Institute, um, yeah, the Institute Bible study people. Or, yeah. Um, and he was arguing that what Jesus was praying was to be rescued from the grave, that, you know, his soul would not be abandoned to, to Sheol, undergo decay, as the Psalms say. Um, and because what Hebrews 5 says is he was heard because of his piety. Uh, he uh, was offered up both prayers and supplications, with loud crying and tears to the one able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his piety. And you know, uh, the standard answer to that would be, well, he was heard and the answer is, eh, well, I heard you, but no. Or if right. it's don't leave me in the grave. And, and the guy makes a lot of a strong case for this because Jesus had said in, in before the garden, what am I supposed to ask to, to be delivered from this? This is why I'm here. This is what I came for was to do this. Like he knew he had to die. Right. And yeah. like, I'm not going to ask to be saved from from the cross, from delivered from this hour because it's it's why I'm here. And so when you're asking, well, well, then what is the cup that he's asking to pass from him? Some people say the suffering itself. Again, I, I don't see that. It, it makes sense that it is the and and again, you'll have to look up the article on Theopolis. I shared it on, on my own Facebook page, but it's just easier to go to their site. Um, but that he was asking in perfect alignment with God's will, that God was pleased to grant him that of, yeah, I'm not going to not going to leave you in the grave. It's exactly as planned on the third day. You're coming out of there. Um, but that would be an alternate interpretation to the praying in God's will versus praying separate from God's will that, that the son and the father don't have separate wills there as, as it is often interpreted. I love, I love I that str- whole discussion. I think that's so interesting to Very me. Of, you have that you have was, did God actually forsake Jesus during those three days? Um, you know, we see him tell the thief on the cross that he's going to be with him in paradise. So we would assume Jesus went to paradise, but then there's also passages about, going and preaching the spirits in prison. It didn't leave his soul in Hades. So yeah, it's such an interesting discussion that is obviously not really a time and place right here. But I would agree with Jack in that based on Hebrews 5, based on saying that God affirmatively answered, you know, in a way that, you know, he, he was heard because of his godly fear, his piety. If Jesus was praying, hey, I don't, you know, take this cup of suffering away from me, this cup of death from me, physical death, then it would seem that God's answer was no. It, to me, it does make more sense that Jesus is praying, hey, don't leave my soul in Hades. And that is what Peter emphasizes in Acts 2 with you know the, the psalm from the Old Testament psalm that you know, David talking about he did not leave his soul in, in Hades. So yeah, I, I would agree with that. That's to me what makes the most sense about what Jesus was praying for, which was in line with God's will. And you could say, well, Jesus, meant, you know, Jesus knew he was going to rise from the dead in three days. He talked about that all throughout his ministry. I feel like there there still would have to be some level of faith if you're going to be put to physical death of like God is going to have to be the one to raise him up. Jesus can't raise himself. And so there even if you, you know, knew that was going to happen or believe that was going to happen, I think there is still some level of God don't leave me down there. Make sure you're bringing make sure you raise me up. Don't leave my soul in Hades like 
you know, you're you're giving up some element of control there if you're Jesus when you're going to your physical death. Because again, he didn't raise himself up. You see that in Acts. God raised him up. God raised him up over and over again. So to me, that makes the most sense. Yeah, I don't know that I fully buy it, um, that I fully agree. But um, just because of what you said, which is I don't think at any point Jesus, in my opinion, because time and again, like destroy the temple in three days, I'll raise it. Throughout his ministry, like it is going to, he didn't just say God's raising me. So, he knew the time. He knew how long it was going to be. He was going to be in the grave. And this has been foretold since the very beginning. We just taught on the uh, the feast of, uh, what is it? The feast of first fruits, which was on the third day after the start of Passover. I, I mean, these things have been laid out. Okay. For so a we're going, time. we're, we're going to episode two. So we've got but time. Yes, so we what do you think Jesus was praying for? I personally think that the immense suffering of his friends forsaking him of everything that was about to happen. I, he knew he was going to death. Uh, I don't think he was trying to pray to get out of death because that's very clear. I think the flesh part of Jesus is looking at it going, I'm about to be beaten. I'm about to be scourged. I'm about to be, have a crown of thorns placed on my head and nailed to a cross. He is all human. I mean, there is, he's all man or he's, but I would he's also, all God, but he's all, all human. Like he does experience pain. And if you're looking at would, the, the sweating sorry, drops of blood, I mean, I look at it as what would cause that? Yeah. The thought of being permanently separated from God, but the whole point of Jesus coming to earth was for him to ultimately raise from the dead. Like if that was not ever promised, if that wasn't, I don't think Jesus would have left heaven if that was like 50, 50 proposition. I would also I might argue raise, I might though, not. I would also argue though that Jesus knew the old Testament prophecies that talk about his hands and feet being pierced. Like that couldn't have changed. So like what, what exactly was Jesus praying for? You I think it saying? was like, to lessen it. it, it and, and it talks about in Isaiah 53. You're right. He was scourged for our transgressions. Like, yeah, all of everything was prophesied before, but as was his resurrection. So it's difficult to say exactly. Well, you're like casting it as as he's sitting there going like that. He was doubting the resurrection so much as like a this. All right. This was the deal. Let's, you know, please. Yeah. You know, hold like there's a your, level of faith side of the bar and, to go into that. Yeah, right. And and that's where Hebrews five is exactly talking about. If he learned obedience from the things he suffered and he was perfected by those things of he had to. Because, that is the, the only point at which God ever had to exercise faith is yeah. in that and so to yours it would the only way that he did not have a separate will from the father the only way in which the answer was not no is if it was a resurrection because if it's the suffering thing he was told no you're wrong you do that's have what to i was going to ask joe like how would you explain hebrews 5 then i mean i think in the days of his flesh he offered a ton of prayer uh, it, like for multiple things i understand what he's saying if i don't think he did abandon him to death yes yeah, so to that extent i do see that you know to your point Hebrews five is a challenge to me, but at the same time, I have a difficult time seeing Jesus having to have faith when it's literally been told all along. It would be the same thing as it's the opposite of your point of like, well, these things have been told all along. Yes. Yeah, so is the resurrection. So is the third day. He's known that from day one, both require a level of faith, both require a level of obedience of literally going to the worst human death of all time. Like it's tough to imagine a worse death than that. And he in his flesh is going to have to undergo that versus I feel like my father's going to abandon me to Hades for, for all time. I I, no, that's like not that. Kind of, I, I, it's not know, that that's right. Exactly. That's We're not, not saying that. Right, it's again, it's the, all right, you know, remember this is, this is the deal. And not that he's, but that was a possibility. It. It's not that he's doubting that, it. It's that then where's faith. Huh? It, it's just, where's the faith? it's saying, all right, if I'm, it I'm, I'm laying my life down. I did not regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped. I'm laying this down. Now, now it's your turn to do your part. I've and as he says in John seventeen, I've glorified you. Now you glorify me. They've taken turns at this, and that he did his part. And now he's saying your turn to do yours. Because the other thing about it, a th there's no there's no textual indication in the entire Bible that he's saying, please don't make me suffer. You have to read that in because the other thing Hebrews five says is with the the offered prayers, supplications, loud crying and tears to the one able to save him, save from, him death from death is literally what it that, says. Right, sure. and and so like. Again, the other there's thing is not I have a, a hard single time. verse you can point to where it says, I don't want to suffer. Because the other, that's the other thing I have a hard time get, coming to grip, grips with is like, so Jesus was saying, God, can you make it a little easier on me? Yeah, make can it make not sure hurt very bad. Make, yeah, make it not, not quite as bad. That just doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Unless the thought was that he was going to hang on the cross for three straight days alive. Like, I don't know. It, if he did answer it in the fact that he did lessen, then that would answer it. I see the points you guys are making. But the point of, well, he didn't doubt, but he had to have faith. If it couldn't happen otherwise, I don't have to like have faith that, uh, I don't know, 
I'm, I'm trying to think of something that's basically an assured thing. Okay, well, okay I have, well, to have hold faith on. in it. We, well, then there, I don't really we, have faith in it. I know it's going to happen. Well, you, we believe we're going to heaven when we die. Is there not still some level of faith? Well, that's still different. some I, level. I don't of... think I came. I don't think I came from heaven and I'm God Himself. Like I don't think it's right, been foretold you... from the foundations of the earth that I'm going to rise in three days. Like, but but that's exactly it. Where it's talking about He became like us to experience what we've experienced because God's never died before. And, and so like he has knowledge of what death is and what it's like, but he's never gone through it. And that's exactly what Hebrews is saying is he can relate to us because he's been, I see he's that. now been through what we've been through and he had never done that before. And, and so now he has, and, and again, God was going to have to be the one to raise literally God. what it's saying is that he's learning faith. He's learning obedience. He's learning those things because God doesn't have to obey people. He's God. Well, here he it is. It just he's, seems like the text is indicating severe duress and what you're saying is like, all right, God, come through for me. That's not sweating drops of blood. That's not like I'm the I would argue either, it is. Yeah. He's I, gonna either be he's terrified he's gonna it's not going to work, which you're saying is doubt. No. You're terrified it's not going to work, which is doubt. No, or, it, I don't understand be... how you'd have that much distress if it's coming through. It, well, because he's about to have a crown of thorns and nails and to my point, and yes. all that. No, no, it, it's, it's, about it's like, like this is going to be really, really I, hard. I, but that's in the other thing Hebrew says is that he went through that with his eyes on the goal on the other side. And so that's what he's sitting down praying for is like, the only reason I'm going through this is because I know what's going to happen on the other side. So, you know, like that's what I'm and this asking. is the first that's time just just... you could argue in Jesus's ministry where he was not going to have control. He had control over who he was healing. He had control over again, just about everything until the point of death. That is a point where, I mean, I, I could see that. I, I, again, I don't want to like put myself in Jesus's shoes or anything, but like I could see sweat drops of blood from that being separated from the father to the point where, Again, you know you're going to you, you cannot control whether or not you raise from the dead. That is or whether you rise from the dead, that is going to be on the father. It's either that, you know, that is you know, not that he was doubting, but I do think that would be some pretty intense reason for sweat drops. But because point. especially if Jesus if Jesus's mind, which all the way from since he was 12 years old, Jesus's mind was on the things of the father, was on high-minded things, was on spiritual eternal things. For him then to be really sweating drops of blood based on man, my my, you know, the the pain that I'm going to experience just seems like a, a sidestep in a way. Does that make sense? Like I I'm not saying that that wasn't on his mind at all, but I feel like what was obviously far more on his mind was separation from the father, going down into Hades, going into Hades, going into the, the realm of the dead. And knowing God was going to have to raise him up, it would make more sense. Versus, to me, man, I I sure would like for this pain to be to be a little bit easier. It would make more sense to me to have the sweating drops of blood to be about to blend in the fact that, and yes, more to your side, but to have the sweating drops of blood be about the physical pain he's about to undergo, and yes, the separation from God, whatever that looks like, which you know is again a diff different discussion but to have yeah. it be about that but to have the prayer itself be about don't leave me in the grave but i have it again it can't there can't be doubt in that and i know you guys are saying that uh, that that there's not doubt if it was sweating drops of blood of like what if god actually leaves me okay but the sweating drops of blood are about and and the the duress is about what he's about to undergo and the fear of uh, and i don't know if it's fear can god experience fear like seems like there is so it's just a difficult discussion, and I know this is I think way it was, off topic from the prayer end of things, so but it is interesting, though. Yeah, <laughs> well, it's the ultimate it is interesting of asking the, God's will, and, and yeah, yeah. So God didn't say no to Jesus, which is what you've heard at countless table talks around the Lord's Supper. Because I would say God didn't. I guess say that's no. what I'm if, asking. If it was even about the, it maybe it could have been way worse. All of those things were to fulfill Scripture. But maybe it could have been way worse. Like if that was yeah. the case, I still don't think God Not said no. And I know one, your yeah. point. I know your point. <laughs> it seems no. I have a very tough time seeing there be any. And I guess let the cut let this cut pass for me. When you read through the text, I think you also have to read into it death as the cut passing for me. It seems like a very present cup as to where he is. To me, it seems you God, have to read the into cup the text. Of God's wrath. That's where. I, that's what I get from that. There's well, the, yeah, I think he, in Jeremiah, he like the wine did not want God's wrath to stay on him, which probably speaks to yours, probably speaks to mine in some ways. I don't think he wanted to have to experience all of God's wrath, which he did on the cross. That's my point is let this cut past from me. On the cross I don't and, and in separation from God, both, I would say. Yeah, but then we have to discuss what exactly is he doing in those three days in the grave, sure. which... Is which he we're actually separate or an hour from... ten already? So oh, yeah. are we? Are we really? <laughs> Holy yeah! God. yeah. So I was going to say yeah. I don't think we're going to settle it here, and we do have enough questions to push to next week. Uh, obviously, we'll we'll 
uh, have a deep end on this for Focus Plus. Uh, and so there's there's a lot more here because we, we've got a lot more of the practical side of prayer, of praying at home with your wife, with your children, you know, the, a lot of questions that come up on that. And so we're going to have anything, on prayer. submit your questions, yeah. I would say. Yeah, if you have anything you want us to cover, because we did do half an outline, so we're probably going to need a little more for next week with all that, unless Joe gets ranting again about uh, <laughs> uh, about Jesus in the garden. Um but no, I, I hey, let's, let's let's fire the debate back up. So. Right, right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Uh, Another thirty minutes. All right. Exactly. Uh, well, and we'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Who uh, who's right? Who's wrong here? Um, you what, guys are probably right, but I hate to admit that you guys are probably right. In this. <laughs> <laughs> Again, I mean, bring scripture. This is not an idea I hold really hard because I came to this. Uh, I found that article a month ago and went, "Wow, he makes a lot of good points." So, uh, again, you can check that article out on Theopolis. Um, Give us your thoughts on that prayer. Again, questions, anything else. And uh, again, as we said at the top, if you hear any ads that are a little bit off, let us know. We're, we're trying to monitor that. We're keeping an eye on it. Um, but I appreciate it. Appreciate you guys being understanding. We're not trying to spam you too much, but we are trying to keep Focus Press afloat. And so thank you for listening. Uh, again, uh, get us your comments, thoughts, uh, and we will talk to you guys next week.